Well, church, good morning. Good morning. As people are still kind of coming in, good morning to those that are worshiping online. I have a feeling that there's a lot of you who are worshiping online this morning with the weather going on. Dorothy, good morning. Good morning, good morning. Um, all right, well, um, I was going to welcome visitors, but I'm thinking that we don't have a lot of visitors this morning. If you are visiting this morning, a very, um, a very special welcome. Um, but go ahead and fill out the friendship registers if you're here in the room. If you are worshiping online this morning, go ahead and click down um, in the little tab and try to fill out the friendship register and let us know you're worshiping online today. Um, a few other announcements that we have today is we have a women's conference that's coming up. Um, on, on, yes, yes, woohoo. Um, on January 27th, um, it's from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, it's going to be a whole lot of fun. They're actually, they're actually letting me come this time, um, which um, bless Katina's heart for letting me come. I appreciate it. Um, there is only two spots left. So, so now if you are interested, um, and that is as of 8.31 um, a.m. this morning, there's two spots left. So go ahead and get signed up um, if you're wanting to come. It is $10 that covers the cost of lunch um, and for you to come. So go ahead and get signed up for that. Um, we also, that same weekend, um, on January 28th, we have a, we have a new membership class um, after the second service. And you can sign up online for that um, or in the comments. So go ahead and get signed up for that. Um, that's all the announcements we have. And so if you're, in the room, if you're in the room or if you're at home, um, then go ahead and stand up and we're going to and we're going to worship the Lord together. Tell what the Lord has done. I live, 
to sing of my Savior's love. I'll live because He is risen. We believe that today, friends. We sing that again. I'll live. I'll live. I'll live to tell what the Lord has done. I'll live to sing of my Savior. Rejoice and be glad in it. Yes, we will. This is the day the Lord has made. And I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day the Lord has made. And I will rejoice and be glad in it. He brought us from glory to dancing, from glory to glory.
and the saints' communion, and in your holy church, I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For Say 
Jesus Christ, my King of heaven, my King forever. Oh, praise to the Lord most high. Oh, praise to the one who saved my life. Oh, praise to Jesus Christ, my King of heaven. Praise to the one who saved my life. All praise to Jesus Christ, my King of heaven, my King forever. Father, you are great here in this place. Dear Heavenly Father, even on a cold, cold morning with ice on the roads and, and with service looking a little different with a, with a smaller group here, Lord, in a smaller, in a different, in a larger group online, Lord, you are great here in this place. Father, we are grateful to be here, here in this place today. And Father, we acknowledge as that song says, Lord, that we are pouring out our praise today, Father, with everything that we have. And Father, whether we're choosing to be here in person, whether we're choosing to be here online today, Lord, we are coming with a posture of praise. And so, Father, we do that today. We give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory here wherever we are today, whether we're whether we're here in this room, whether we're in our living room, whether we're at our kitchen table, 
wherever we are. Today, Jesus, we give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. Now, Jesus, focus us. Focus our minds, focus our hearts as we open your word. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we, that we pray all these things. And all the church said, Amen. Amen. Amen, church. You can be seated. Good morning, all the, the brave souls that came out in the cold weather and the snow drifts. Uh, if you're watching online, you didn't click on the wrong link. I'm filling in for Pastor Bob today. Um, he and a team are in Nepal. And we got an email this morning that they, they've arrived safely. Praise God. So we think of them today as they are a long way from home. So we'll be looking today in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Um, if you use the Bible in the chair in front of you, that's page 166 in the back. But let's pray before we, uh, before we dive into God's word here. Father God, I thank you. Um, you are a loving and merciful God, and, and uh, stand in awe of you. And we thank you that we can gather and we can look at um, your word, uh, what a blessing it is that you have given us direction in life uh, through your word. God, we pray for the, the missionary team uh, in Nepal. We pray for safety, uh, and we pray for success for their mission, Lord. We thank you that they were, were faithful to your call to go on this trip, uh, and we just, we just pray for them uh, in the coming weeks. Lord, I thank you for uh, keeping each person in this room safe as they drove uh, to church this morning. And uh, Lord, just open up our hearts and our minds as we uh, want to be sharpened by your word. Guide us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Second Timothy uh, chapter 3, starting in verse 10. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all, the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. You know, as I studied this, this passage, uh, two things uh, kind of stood out to me the power of God's word, and the power of discipleship. There's a close uh, relationship here between Paul and Timothy, and Paul uses himself as an example to lead Timothy. But it's not just his example, it's the example in Scripture as well. He keeps going back to what Scripture does in life. So discipleship balanced with Scripture is what really stood out to me in this passage. And it's funny, uh, this example kept standing out in my mind, and, and most of you who know me know that I'm really not much into sports. Um, 
I'll watch a game here and there. But the thing that kept standing out to me is a football team. You know, it has an owner, it has a head coach, it has assistant coaches, and it has players, right? So the owner wants to equip his team with everything that they need. So he hires a coaching staff, and he hires the right players. But he also gives them a playbook. Without that playbook, you could have the best coach, you could have the best coaching staff, you could have the best players, but there would be confusion, and there would be disunity. And that kind of stood out as an example to me. Us in life, in the church, God is our owner. He gives us the apostles, he, he gives us examples, coaches, and he gives us our fellow players. One thing that stood out to me last week uh, in Todd Patterson's message was this living a fully integrated life, the spiritual and the physical together, because that's what we're supposed to do every part of our life, right? And he reminded us of that command in Scripture to have dominion and to be fruitful. And when we live apart from Scripture and we live apart from God, we're unfruitful. And we'll look at that a little bit today. Uh, but let's look first at the examples that were set uh, by Timothy and Paul. And we'll start with Timothy. The context of this letter is Paul writing to Timothy. Uh, it's the second letter he wrote him. Uh, sometime, they think, between AD 64 and 67. Paul was in prison at the time, but he was encouraging Timothy, who he had discipled closely, uh, and he was encouraging him in these letters on a couple of topics, but he wrote about church leadership. He instructed how to set up elders and deacons. Uh, he t gave just general encouragement to Timothy. But one thing which is closer to the context of this passage is he encouraged and challenged Timothy to confront false teaching. If you look at the beginning of, of chapter 3, 1 through 9, uh, Paul is explaining some, some problems that are going to be coming. And he talks about uh, deception and false teaching and how dangerous that is. So then he goes into these verses of, that we just read, encouraging how to combat that in the church. Timothy is also an example to us because he was willing to be discipled. How often in the church do we have people that just come and go, they just attend, don't really want to get too close to people, right? Timothy was willing to be discipled by Paul. In fact, they were so close that in the beginning of both of these letters, Paul refers to Timothy as his child in faith. In this letter, he calls him his beloved child. So there's a very close relationship there, and Timothy was open to being discipled. Also, Timothy was willing to obey and willing to suffer. In chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, uh, Paul encourages Timothy to share in sufferings as a fellow soldier. And Paul often uses this, this language of being a soldier, that we're in battle, and Timothy was willing to be used and uh, suffer. Uh, in Philippians, Paul says he's sending Timothy to the church in Philippi. So Timothy was willing to be used and be obedient. Paul's example. Paul was an apostle, but he was also a man that was willing to disciple. He was willing to invest time into people. He was willing to live a life that was a worthy example. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, <clears throat> Paul says, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So Paul knew that he wasn't a perfect example, but he tried to imitate Christ, right? And that Christ is the perfect example. But God used the apostles in a special way. He used the apostles to set the foundation for the church. Ephesians 2, verses 19 through 21, it says, So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, 
Christ Jesus being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple of the Lord. That's exciting that we are also building on this foundation that was set by the apostles. Christ is that cornerstone that holds it all together. The apostles set the foundation and we are also building upon this. So in verse 10 here, Paul likes to give lists, and he gives us a list here. So he's reminding Timothy of the example that that he, that Paul set, and he's saying that you, Timothy, have followed my teaching. The New King James Version translates that doctrine. So he's followed the teaching that Paul set forward that was in accordance with all the Old Testament, with Jesus' teaching in the New Testament. And he was, he was teaching doctrine that we get to use, that we benefit from in the epistles uh, that teach us about godly living and teach us about God. He has followed Paul's conduct or his manner of life. Paul lived it out. Didn't matter the threat that, that he faced. Remember, he was writing this letter from in prison. He was obedient to God no matter what. Paul's aim in life, uh, I believe the NASB says the purpose. Paul's aim in life, he says repeatedly throughout his, his letters, is to testify to the gospel. That was his aim in life, to testify the gospel and the glory of God around. And finally, he says, my faith So even through all that persecution, even through all those trials, Paul had faith in God. Paul had faith that God was using him. Paul had faith that um, God was trustworthy. And he kind of switches gears here, I think, a little bit in this, this last part of the list. And I think it has a more personal meaning showing how he acted in the persecution. So he goes on to list... Patience, love, and steadfastness. Paul exampled patience in that when he was imprisoned, when he was beaten, he was patient with God. He knew this was not a mistake. God has something in store for me. He exampled love. He he kept his love while being persecuted. He witnessed to the prison guards He witnessed to his fellow prisoners who were in prison for actual crimes. Paul was in prison just for proclaiming Christ. But he kept his love. He kept his love for God. Even though he was being persecuted, he kept his love for his neighbor. And his steadfastness, also translated perseverance. Paul didn't give up hope. It's amazing how he could write with such positivity being in prison. And we know that Roman uh, prisons were not comfortable places. But Paul remained steadfast or persevered through it. He also talks here, he lists some specific places that he was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. Now, this is not an exhaustive list of all the places where Paul was persecuted, but this was a a list of places where Timothy would have uh, either witnessed or had close knowledge. They were all in that area. You know, if I was Pastor Bob, I'd have a map with a pointer. Um, This was all around the area where Timothy was raised and was, was ministering. So these are, he's pointing examples that Timothy would have known about. And he says that, He endured the persecutions, and yet from them, the Lord rescued him. And Paul doesn't say he kept him from persecution, right? But he rescued him out of persecution. In fact, there's an example in Acts where Paul was stoned and left for dead in this region. Um, So he is acknowledging God did save him from death in that instance, 
Uh, but he didn't save him out of persecution. He helped him persevere. And he kept him going for the purposes that God wanted to use Paul. So now he goes on to compare people or groups of people. So there's two groups of people, and we'll start with the first one here. In verse 12, all, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus. So that's one group. All, not some, all who desire to live a godly life. I think it's important to note that he doesn't just say all who desire God, right? Because you can hide. He's saying all who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted. He also doesn't say that all persecution will be the same. I think we can acknowledge that throughout times and places in history, persecution is higher and lower, Uh, we're blessed to live in an area of the world that persecution is low. Sometimes I think we like to lament that uh, it's bad here, but we are so blessed to be able to worship freely. There are areas of the world that's not the case. There are areas where people are being killed, being beaten, being put in prison. So he doesn't say persecution is all the same, but that all who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted. I don't think this is the prosperity gospel he's pushing. But he's exampling for us three ways to act in the persecution. Follow biblical teaching, live a faithful life, and be steadfast through persecution. The second group of people here says, while evil people and imposters, evil people and imposters. So there are two people, right? There are evil people who will obviously be evil to us, and there are imposters. Those are people who appear to be a thing, right? They're acting like a thing. And what do these people do? They will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So I think we can see that in the world around us, can we not? We can see this in all the way, uh, in all of church history, um, that those that are not following God, not following his word, are deceived, and they fall into sin. And our world is pushing a lot of these ideas, and I just wanted to touch on a couple. Obviously, this is not an exhaustive list of things out there, but what does the world say about God's law? or his word. The world says that God's law is oppressive, that it's hateful. And we kind of hear that even in some of the media we see around us. It says that we want to oppress people, victimize people with God's word. But we know that that's not true. God's word is a message of love and of hope. What could be more loving and hopeful than a message that says, We are fallen, and he has paid the price for us. He offers us free salvation. It's not a message of oppression oppression or hate. It's a message of hope. What about the issue of abortion in the world? The world says that uh, it's a woman's right. The world says that the child in the mother's womb has no value. It's not a life. People will even use scripture to try to deceive us with this. I remember uh, after Roe v. Wade was overturned, uh, Governor Newsom in California put up a billboard inviting women from surrounding states to come get abortions there, and he used scripture. He used Mark 12, verse 31, that says, love your neighbor as yourself. He used scripture to try to deceive But the message of the Bible is that life has value. We are created in God's image, every life, even the life in the womb. The psalmist says that he knit us together in the womb. Each life has value. But the message doesn't stop there because it gives us hope. 
we have an offer of complete forgiveness for the woman who's had an abortion. We have an offer of complete forgiveness for the man that pressured the woman to get an abortion. We have complete forgiveness offered for the parent who pressured their daughter to get an abortion. You see, there's complete forgiveness, complete restoration, complete healing available through Christ. His death paid the price in full. It's not a message of hate. It's a message of love. What about sexuality and gender in our, in our culture? Right? The, the world says you can have whatever partner you want, however many partners you want. Um, you probably shouldn't get married because marriage is patriarchal and oppressive. Um, so you probably shouldn't do that. And you can be whatever you want to be. But we know this too is false. God says that marriage is between a man and a woman. It's in a covenant with him. His word says that he created the man and woman. And again, pointing back to that, he knit you together in the womb. Your life has value. God made you exactly how you are. You're not a mistake. But there's a message of hope in all of this as well. If you've lived a life of sexual sin, or you're in a life of sexual sin, if you're trapped in pornography, there's a message of hope and love. Turn from it. Turn to Christ. There's complete forgiveness available. Trust in him. Trust in who he made you to be. So the world will even use the Bible to try to deceive So let's look at this tool, this inspired tool. In verse 14, Paul goes on to say, But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So Paul, knowing Timothy knew that he was converted at a young age, that he was raised by his mother and his grandmother, and that they raised him in the, the ancient, the sacred writings. And how much of a blessing that was for Timothy, and that it made him wise for salvation. It doesn't say that we're saved by wisdom of the scriptures. Many people study the Bible uh, and remain unsaved but that for us as, as redeemed people, it makes us wise. Completely well-rounded in the scripture makes you well-rounded in salvation. And there's kind of three main messages that, that the Bible tells us about um, that help us in that area. It reveals who God is. Remember, he's not the God of hate and oppression. He's the God of love and sacrifice and salvation. It reveals who we are. We're fallen, and we need salvation. I think we're told by the world a lot of the times that uh, in this postmodern world where there's no truth and you can't tell somebody anything is wrong, it reveals that we are fallen in our nature. And it reveals God's plan for salvation, and it reveals how that, salvation, that, that plan came to fruition in Christ. So, verse 16, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable. What does it mean that it's breathed out or also uh, translated inspired? Warren Worsby in his commentary writes, Revelation means the communication of truth to man by God. Inspiration has to do with the recording of this communication in a way that is dependable. So God revealed to man, and it was recorded dependably. Matthew Henry puts it this way in his commentary. It is a divine revelation which we may depend upon as infallibly true. The same spirit that breathed reason into us breathes revelation among us. He points to 2 Peter 1.21. 
For the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of man, but holy men spoke as they were moved or carried forth by the Holy Ghost. He goes on to point out the prophets and apostles did not speak from themselves, but what they received from the Lord that they delivered to us. Communication from God to man, it's dependable, infallibly true. So Paul goes on with another list here. What is this inspired word good for? What's it profitable for? So it is profitable for teaching. That means teaching what is right. It's good for reproof. It's also translated, uh, I believe, in the newer NASB as rebuke. We really like that word, don't we? Rebuke. What is not right? And it's good for correction. For how to get right. And for training in righteousness. That's how to stay right. What's the outcome of this word profiting in a man's life? Paul goes on to say that the man of God, now this is not just saying Timothy or just men, it's people of God, that the man of God may be complete. This also does not mean sinless or perfect, right? This is that well-rounded, complete in their faith. That the man of God will be equipped for every good work. The New King James says thoroughly equipped. So again, this doesn't mean that we're perfect, but it means that he's equipping us. It means that he's equipping us to live a fully devoted life to him, that spiritual and physical together, that when things get hard, when we trip, that we will come back to his word for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training. It's not a one-time tool. It's a lifelong tool. We have to use it. We have to use it in the battle of our lives. Our lives should be a sacrifice to him. Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. He's given us this tool to help us discern what is good, acceptable, and perfect, to help us to be a sacrifice that is honoring to him. We live a a life that has a two-fronted battle, though. We kind of touched on already the one front of the battle is from outside, right? It's from all those systems and lies and imposters, um, but we have another front of the battle, which is our sinful nature. Right? We can deceive ourselves. James puts it this way, James 1, 14 and 15. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. It's a tool we use to to battle our own sinful desires. We use it to teach ourselves, to rebuke ourselves, to correct ourselves, and to train ourselves with the Bible and the Holy Spirit. It's not up to just us to figure out, right? I was reminded this morning, we pray for wisdom, right? And that's through God's Word and His Holy Spirit sharpening you. We run to him because he never leaves us. 
we don't fight alone. Romans 8, 38 and 39 says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate you from the love of Christ Jesus our Lord. He is always with us. You don't fight alone. And we take every, ca- every thought captive. We take every thought captive. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. We destroy strongholds with his word. We destroy arguments and lofty opinions. Colossians 3 verse 2 says, Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. But praise God, we are not saved by our performance and how well we fight this battle because Christ has won the battle. Amen? Amen. Christ has already won. There's no way that I can be a good enough soldier to earn my salvation. Jesus did that for me. So let's think back to that uh, football analogy. Are you on the team? If you're not on the team, why not? Think about that. Think about why you have not joined God's team. He offers you the most loving and generous gift. He offers you salvation. Jesus Christ came to earth, lived a perfect life, was killed for my sin, for your sin, and he offers you free salvation. Really think about that. If you are on the team... Do you use the playbook? Do you run your own plays, or do you run the plays that the owner gave us? Because it's pretty easy to not use the playbook and get on the field, and the quarterback thinks you're going to cut left because that's what the playbook says, and you cut right. Interception. Kind of looks a little like the Bears. (laughs) Do you have teammates? Do you have teammates on the team and you see they get knocked down? Do you help your teammate up? See, we're not alone in this battle. God gave us the local church. It's a blessing to have the local church. That's our our immediate team, right? Church membership is important. In fact, we have a class on January 28th. If anybody's interested in membership, we can discuss why it's important. Um, God gives us teammates. We have to support each other. We have the same goal, right? We have the same goal, and that's to bring the gospel out. So if you're on the sidelines, if you're on the team, you have the playbook and you're on the sidelines, let's get in the game. Get in the game. So I'm going to leave you with some questions. And I want you to, over this next week, just reflect on these questions. And the first, it's similar to the the football analogy, do you know Jesus as Savior and Lord? Do you know him? If you don't, I would ask you why. Look into the scripture. Maybe start reading John, the book of John. Call a Christian friend, ask questions. This is the most important question in life. Who is Jesus? If the answer is yes, then go to these next two questions. Am I being equipped by the deception of sin, my own sin, and by the world? Or am I being equipped by the inspired word of God? It's pretty easy to get consumed with the world around us, our own activities. Um, It's good to reflect on these things. And third... How does God want me to grow in this area? We all have room to grow. 
Every single person has room to grow because, again, no one is perfect. How does God want to grow you specifically in this area? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your loving and perfect plan of salvation. Jesus, I thank you that you obeyed the will of the Father, that you took my sin, you took what I deserved. Thank you, Lord. I thank you that you didn't leave us on this world to fight this, this battle on our own, that you give us your word to direct us, that we can use to, to judge our own thoughts, to judge the thoughts of the world with. I thank you that you give us uh, a teammates, you give us fellow believers. Thank you that you give us disciples that challenge us and that we can grow with. Lord, I pray that you would use each believer in this room. Lord, you have a plan for each one of them. Help us to seek you in that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, amen. Friends, if you're able, let's stand as we close in song together.
Friends, I love that question that Mike asked. Just that simple question, just, and it is, are you on the team? And just that's something that it's so simple, but it's something that we can kind of, we can kind of forget our spot on the team, well, while every person has a spot on the team. And so I just kind of want to challenge you today that if you're, if you're questioning that, and if you're kind of like, hey, I don't know what it means to be on the team. Or, hey, I want to be on the team. Help me figure that out. Talk to one of us after the, after the service. Talk to me. Talk to Mike. Find an elder um, and talk to us. And if you're somebody online that if you're like, hey, I want to figure out how to be on the team, and I call the office and I shoot us an Instagram message and I shoot us something. Um, in a way, we want to connect with you in that way and we want to help you walk in this journey. Um, Church, and, I, and as we close, would you pray with me? Father, we are so thankful that you call us, um, that, and that you call us to more, and that you call us to be a part of your team. And so, Father, help us as we go on this journey in life to, um, and to follow you well and to serve you well. And, uh, Father, we want to... And as the song just and just said that when all of our races are um, are complete, when all of our races are done, we want to be able to say that it wasn't by any of our strength that we did anything, but it was by yours, um, and that and that we followed your will to the best of our abilities. And so, Father, help us to do that. Um, Lord, we love you, and we give you all the praise and all the honor here in this place. And it's in your Son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Church, be blessed as you, as you go from here. Um, get home safe.